Genshin is bewildering. There are times when I ask myself, why am I doing this? Not why am I playing Genshin? Because I think there are abundantly obvious reasons why people enjoy exploring and fighting mobs, but why am I reading dialogue that seems to not respect my time or my intelligence? Thelxie's fantastic adventure starts when the Traveler is tasked with figuring out why fish in a certain area have begun disappearing. The Commissioner thinks it may be linked to a superstition in Fontaine of a monster named Thelxie. Its appearance differs depending on who you ask and it lures children into the depths of the ocean. She even says that recently someone saw a child in the area wander into the ocean. The Traveler and Paimon think this fake monster is used to simply dissuade children from entering the ocean because they are, and they hop on out to figure out what's going on. When they arrive, they find Frimine and assume he was the child mentioned. He chats with the pair and lets them know that he's doing this for a commission, and that he's been underwater often, and that his gear is likely what's scaring the fish. We come to learn who Frimine's commissioner is when they come upon a woman named Zuria who is humming a melody near the lake. Zuria states that she has a son who's suffering from something called loneliness syndrome, essentially depression. He's crafted a story in his head about Thelxi, thinking it was kicked from its kingdom where they were the rightful king and that they're now all alone because of it. So the main objective here is to craft a picture book of Thelxi combating these troubles and regaining his crown in order to help the sun change their delusion. If that's done, then maybe the sun can replace a negative reality with a more positive one. In this quest, we dive deeper into what drives Frimine. Frimine explains his own dealings with depression. Not that he's experienced it, but that he's seen others succumb to it in the House of the Hearth. At first, I was a little disappointed that we didn't get the perspective of someone who's dealt with depression. But then it becomes abundantly clear that Frimine uses his own fantasies to battle his own demons. It may not be depression, per se, but Frimine is a character that has issues connecting with others and feeling like a burden to those around him. We see him wear his helmet when he's embarrassed here, but that helmet is what helps Frimine deal with the depths of his own heart. We know that vision bearers can breathe underwater, so why then does Frimine even wear a helmet? Well, it's to block out the noise of the water and allow his mind to take hold. Underwater, he can imagine a world free of stress or burdens and bring himself into a world of his own creation. But instead of it being a delusional melody, Frimine dons his helmet to guide his mind into a melodic state, so he may write the ills of his heart through fantastical thoughts. This is why Frimine's helmet is the symbol of bandages, because it's the cure to his mental pains. So the pair, Frimine and Zuria, go on a mission to create the picture book for Zuria's son. Along the way, they act out the scenes in the picture book so they can make the story as vivid and realistic as possible. They have to believe in the stories for these stories to have any power. A robot Thelxi is made for this task by Frimine, as it's supposed to be a companion for Zuria's son. This robot Thelxi was supposed to be made with a language module intact, but due to not having the parts, Frimine wasn't able to make one, so Thelxi seems unable to speak. Regardless, it acts as a companion in their quest to bring to life a story about triumphing over struggles. The last bit of the play is retrieving Thelxi's crown, but before they get it, they wait for Zuria, but learn something disturbing instead. In probably the most tragic twist Genshin has honestly ever had, we come to learn that Zuria's son has already passed away, before she even tasked Frimine with the commission to begin with. In fact, the belief that her son is really alive is in fact a delusion, also brought upon by her own depression. This twist really hits hard because it's already a subversion on top of another subversion. Early on, you're unsure of what the commissioner is referring to when she states a boy went into the water. But when you see Frimine, you, as well as the Traveler and Paimon, naturally think that the boy was Frimine. Most media has a hard time doing, well, any harm to child characters, so to have one here pass in a really vivid way is shocking. So the boy actually being Zuria's son comes as an actual shock here, even though it was choreographed from the beginning. Speaking of choreography, this quest is like a well-trained flamenco dance, with each plot point coming at you quickly, with the progression of plot beats having just enough time to set in, but not enough time to spoil the impact. This is further proof that we don't need bombastic scenarios for an event to be great. This was essentially a few characters acting on a play and speaking to each other, yet I think this was the most deftly written event 
the game has ever seen. Don't get me wrong though, we do need more bombastic ensemble pieces within Genshin, but this quest has proven that those won't be the only things that can hold narrative weight, especially when they drive with such emotional horsepower like this quest. I've spoken of my disappointment with Dunyazard and Tepe, and this is precisely why I'm praising this plot point here. The emotional weight at this reveal is above both of those, and it was done in a fraction of the time. When the crew learn the truth of Zuria's son's passing, they go to see her. She's too depressed to come out, so they want to complete the play and retrieve the crown and bring it to her, in the hopes that the tale can lift her out of the abyss. But it's mentioned by her doctor that Zuria had found inscribed seashells that her son had taken with him on his final dive. When combined, the inscriptions create a rendition of a line from the play The Tempest by Shakespeare. To simplify the play a bit, and by a bit I mean a lot, a man named Prospero was supposed to be a duke of a kingdom, but his brother ousted him and took his crown. Years later, Prospero attempts to enact vengeance on his brother and take his crown back. So the play begins with Prospero using a spirit named Ariel to shipwreck his brother's ship on their island. He doesn't kill anyone on the boat, but they all become separated. His brother's son, Ferdinand, believes his father to be dead after the shipwreck, and Prospero plays into this, telling Ariel to go and play into his fears that his father might truly be dead. This is when Ariel, a sea spirit, sings this spiteful lull. Full fathom five thy father lies, of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Sea nymphs hourly ring his knell. Burden. Hark, now I hear them. This line is a beautiful way to express death at the hands of the sea, with the imagery of his bones becoming coral and his eyes changing to pearls, but it can also apply to death as a means of change rather than an ending. Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change. It's no secret then why the Genshin writers had the boy submerge himself into the depths with shells attached. Perhaps the boy's delusions made him hear Thelxi calling to him, luring him to the bottom of the ocean to join him, so that it may not be lonely anymore. The Thelxi is named after a Greek siren, after all. So then, Thelxi lures children to their deaths, into the depths of the ocean, the depths representing depression. The deeper down you go, the darker things become, as less light from the surface reaches you, and you lose all air. The story, then, is about how depression takes us and never lets us go. But I don't think that's the end of the story. The quest hits on this idea of changing perspectives. If they can change the fate of Thelxi in this new picture book and return his crown and family to him, then the sun's outlook may change too. If the same event can be viewed in different ways, then the outcome can look brighter. Thelxi is made to look like a penguin by Fremine. In his own fantasies, Fremine creates penguins to help him with his own struggles. Penguins are creatures that can dive deep into the ocean, but also return to the surface and walk its glimmering shores. As a symbol, they represent overcoming these deep depths of despair. So the crew gathered shells, which we initially declared symbolized death at the hands of depression, as the quote suggested, but they're now used as a weapon by Thelxi, who fights back against the darkness with them. Zarya is given the completed picture book, with the crown acquired, and she begins to accept the passing of her son. Thelxi begins to speak to her, and she can hear its words. Fremine notes that the Traveler can hear its words too if they just don his helmet. The in-universe reason is that both Thelxi and Fremine's helmet were crafted with the same devices attached so that they can communicate. But metaphorically, we know Fremine's helmet to be the one used to see fantastical worlds. So with the helmet on, the Traveler sees the sun's soul within Thelxi and gets to listen to Zuria and her son's parting words to each other. As Zuria sings a lullaby for him as he takes his final rest. The cast declares this as a miracle. (laughs) 
One interpretation of The Tempest is that it's a play about the theater itself. Prospero uses others, like the spirit Ariel, to perform duties for him, like actors, and even at certain points hides himself away to watch these choreographed scenarios from behind the scenes. The Tempest itself, the title of the play, is a manufactured storm to shipwreck the boat. Theater and all art then are represented as magic in the play. Equivalently, Thelxie's picture book is meant to act as magic to help the boy's mental state, to change his perspective on his current depression. Instead, this ends up being true for Azuria, after they participate in the magic show that is the theater play of the Thelxi performance. When they started the book, Zuria painted her pictures without color. The paintings were dreary and sorrow-filled. In retrospect, this is due to her own depression and inability to see the world in a new way. But when the cast suggests that the pages should have more color in them, Zuria changes her perspective. Without knowing it, they're slowly changing how she's viewing the events of her son's passing and beginning to add color into her life. The mother begins to see color, and Thelxi becomes something else. Else. Initially a story about a siren luring children into the depths, a symbolic monster for depression that drags you down with it, now becomes a story about combating depression by using fiction. Thelxie becomes a representation of Zuria's son, a companion who has come back from the depths to help his mother combat her own depression by using the shells of his own sea change. And thus the siren song is changed from one begetting death and sorrow to one announcing a joyous miracle. Genshin is bewildering. At times, I see its story as trite and lackluster, with filler stuffed into every corner, but then quests like this will come along, with meaning and symbolism bursting at its seams, and characters who embody ideas greater than themselves. Like a siren, Genshin calls me back in, because there's something there. Sometimes, it's an illusion, but sometimes, even if those times are slim, it's powerful fiction. And even through its many, many imperfections, there's something there asking to be heard. And with the right perspective, sometimes we can hear its soul.